everyone. Uh, my name is Larry Clark. I'm technical director in the drama department here at the University of Alberta. And uh, while you might see this on Google Earth or otherwise as Edmonton, Alberta, I'd like to remind us all that we are gratefully taking our place on Treaty 6 territory. We do respect the history, languages, and cultures of the First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada. And I'm grateful that their presence continues to inform and feed us as we continue along. Welcome, welcome all to uh, the final day uh, of our symposiums on open education. Uh, I would love to introduce the session we're titling Evaluating Open Pedagogies and Quality. And I'm very grateful that we have three guests with us, Sally Binden from Vancouver Island University, Lucy Griffith from Vancouver Community College, and Chad Finn from Medicine Hat College. Uh, with no further ado, I'd like to hand the reins over to them. Um, first off, I would just like to acknowledge that Medicine Hat College is on the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy and the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. And I'd also like to acknowledge and honor the homeland of the Métis people. So uh, we are here to discuss open pedagogy. And uh, I also have with me two very close friends of mine. And I will take a chance to kind of go around the room and introduce ourselves and give a little bit of our backgrounds. But I warn you, when the three of us get into conversations, particularly around pedagogy, we can get spicy and we can get excited. So we will, we will be having fun. Hopefully you will all pick up on the fun as well. And we would just ask that we will be having some time at the end for Q&A, or I don't even like to call it Q&A because when we're talking about open pedagogy, are there really any answers? Um, but definitely some conversation towards the end for everybody to jump in. So my name is Chad Flynn, as, as Larry already mentioned. I am the Dean of Trades and Technology here at Medicine Hat College. Previous to this, I was a learning technologies trainer at SAS Polytech for a short time. And then previous to that, I was an electrical instructor at BCIT. At my time at BCIT, I fell in love with the concept of pedagogy, ended up chasing down a Master of Arts in Learning Technologies at Royal Roads University. It was at that time that I just dove headfirst into the concept of open educational resources and open educational practices or open pedagogy. In fact, my thesis was based completely around using open educational resources and pedagogy in trades-based education. So when we start talking about open pedagogy, it's just it's it's more than just a uh, a topic for me. It's a passion. It's a hobby. It's it's kind of something that I, I dive in and just cannot get enough of. So that's myself, and I'll, I'll pass myself off to uh, Lucy. I oh, wasn't ready for that. That's okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lucy Griffith. Um, I'm actually from Vancouver Community College, but I'm joining you today from uh, Surrey, um, from Surrey, BC. So um, you know, I, I'd like to honour the existence of the first people by acknowledging the traditional and unceded territory of the Katsi, Semiamu, Kwantlen um, and other Coast Salish people um, and known today as Surrey. And um, wow, do I appreciate this place um, and its beauty and its people. And one of the great things that's, that's happened to me after I mean, I've lived in, in Canada for coming on or since 2006. So it's been it's been a long time now. And and um, and I've just. I've been so lucky to be around um, such passionate people um, regards to, you know, the direction. One of the specializations that we look at is, is TVET, but looking at the specialization in how can we provide access? How can we provide um, learning to everybody and, um, and, and the resources that, um, you know, for every, everybody that walks through life and Vancouver community college is that it's a place where, um, it's, it's all about inclusion and it's all about access. So I'm really proud to have been working here for the past 14 years. Um, you know, as you can hear, you know, and I mentioned I'm from the UK where open pedagogy has been, you know, it's been one of those things that has always been around since I left secondary school. Um, I could have gone into, um, you know, open university to do all my studies. Um, I didn't have to, you know, physically attend a school, um, you know, in person. Um, and also education is free up until, you know, you up until 21 years old. So when I left school and went into post-secondary, I had that accessibility to be able to attend education free of charge um, for anybody. And um, but there's also social cultural circles, too, in the UK that is um, that, you know, really does set you aside on, you know, who goes where, who goes to university, who goes to trade school. So having open, accessible education 
you know, is a huge passion. And now in my role, you know, I started out in the trades, I traveled, I then went back to ac academics, I did my, um, you know, my, my teacher training and onward, you know, I received my master's in education at SFU. And now I'm in the position of an associate director for trade technology and design at VCC and, and weaving in and out the um, acting dean position, as any of you know, that's in this position, you tend to take on a, a lot more um, uh, responsibility. But now, you know, we, we're in this position where we can make this possible for people. So it's, um, so as Chad said, it's, um, it's, we do get spicy when we talk about this kind of stuff, because we feel very strongly that, no matter who you are or where you're from, you deserve the best education out there, the best education possible. So I'm really happy to be here today and um, meeting with everybody here in the room and, uh, and um, yeah, looking forward to getting started with the conversation. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass the baton over to Sally. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Lucy. Hi there, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Sally Binden. I'm from Vancouver Island University. I'm coming to you today from um, the Nanaimo campus, and I'm very grateful to be on the unceded territory of the Sanaimo people and, uh, you know, where we are honoured to, you know, study, work, play and share knowledge, which we hope today to share knowledge with you, but only um, from our own experiences and we hope that this is going to be a two-way street because we know that we have lots to learn from you here with us today as well. Just a little bit of background, I started um, my career in education um, approximately 20 years ago and I was, um, I came into Malaspina University College as a hairdressing instructor and I, uh, as I uh, pursued that career I wanted to know more I wanted to know how I could support my students better and so I found my way into a, um, a master's program through the flexible admission so that was my first you know idea of what it meant to have access and um, and I this was a, a real um life-changing opportunity for me. I had uh, started my education in the UK, my K-12 education, and as Lucy just mentioned, um, in the UK it's very well known for its social stratification and its division of those that are deemed suitable for university and those that go into trade school. And, uh, and so I think coming from that place really propelled me to continue my education. And in 2020, I I actually defended my PhD in curriculum and pedagogy. And so, um, as ch you know, Chad mentioned, very passionate about pedagogy, but from a leadership perspective, I think I come to this conversation as those of you who ever have time to read my dissertation or 220 pages of it, 220 pages <laughs> of it, um, which was... Uh, looking at instructors, professors' um, perceptions around that shape their curriculum decisions. And I think that is a, you know, a real, this is very central to the conversation we're going to have today around those mindsets, around the decisions we make about how we teach and, and how, how our students learn. Okay, back to you, Chad. That's, that's all about me. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, Lucy. So as we dive into this discussion about open pedagogy and quality, what I th we thought would be important is to define open pedagogy. And anybody who's, I know I'm preaching to the choir for some of you, but anybody who's involved in these discussions knows that it's a really hard concept to nail down and to define. There's many different definitions out there. So what we're going to do is I'm going to share with you by my screen just the framework that we're going to, and then we're going to kind of go around and just share kind of our ideas as well. Um, from our practices and our experiences. So open pedagogy is teaching and learning practices where openness is enacted within all aspects of instructional practice, including the design of learning outcomes, the selection of teaching resources, and the planning of activities and assessment. OEP or open educational practices engage both faculty and students with the use and creation of OER, draw attention to the potential afforded by open licenses, facilitate open peer review, and support participatory direct, student-directed projects. Michael Pascovesia. So this is, you notice I've got some things highlighted here. And for us, when we think about open pedagogy, it's the 
it's inviting the students into the idea that they can be part of the learning out, of determining what their learning outcomes are of, of the selection of teaching resources, the planning of activities and assessment. And one thing that really excited me was the participatory student directed projects. And I'll, we'll talk about that as we go here. So um, maybe Sally, if you could start off, with, we, we talked right before we got on here about just sharing a little bit about what each of us thinks open pedagogy is. This is Michael Pascovesius. It's a great framework, yeah. but what's our own little lens to it? Yeah, yeah, great question. And I'll just add that I was very fortunate to work with Michael for a very brief time here at Vancouver um, Island University. And then he nipped off further south and is with uh, UVic now. But I'm so grateful for all that he contributes to this topic. So for me, I think that... Um, you know, open pedagogy, it really is around shifting mindsets. It shifts the mindset of, first of all, um, as, as was in Michael's uh, statement there, that designing of learning outcomes. So to, to shift our practice in how we design our learning outcomes is really requires us to shift their mindsets about what it means to teach and ultimately what it means to learn. And so for me, what I see the really big shift is, and I was fortunate to de design one of the very first um, fully trades programs. Um, I designed it online. And so this was prior to COVID. And what I learned throughout that, pro that process of taking this open pedagogical approach mindset to that is that you're really looking at information flowing in the other direction. So if we think about traditional teaching, we're very much, or the, you know, the older mindset was that, yes, the information flows from those that hold the knowledge to the, the learners, the learners were, well, you know, a bit of freedom, a bit of flexible here, but basically, you know, not to be too narrow-minded about it, but we were hoping that our learners would be able to reshape, regurgitate this knowledge and send it back to us, whereas the online platform provided me this opportunity around structuring my learning outcomes. And then, of course, the essential piece in here is those learning activities, the participatory learning activities, and then ultimately the assessments that actually provides this platform so that the knowledge is being constructed by those learners. And um, obviously with interactions, dialogues, dialogue, and then the knowledge is flowing this way. So the learner owns it. Awesome. Thanks, Sally. Lucy, some thoughts on your ideas? Yeah, I'm going to piggyback on Sally's thoughts. I mean, the reason why we collaborate every day, the three of us and, the, and our other colleagues that can't join us today is because we are you know, fully on the same mindset. But I have, I have three different points that, you know, that that pushes my passion for um, for OER. And, you know, the first one is what Sally talked about is students taking responsibility for their learning. Gone are the days where we would stand there and spoon feed our students with the education that they should that they should consume. Like, this is what you should know. This is, um, you know, this is the, the course outlines. This is the objectives of the course. You know, at looking at it, you know, the whole thing holistically, very differently, where to say, we're on this journey together. We want to get to this point, but you need to take a massive responsibility as a student to direct the learning um, in a pathway that you feel will serve your success, that you feel will serve you better. So rather than, you know, 90% of the course be already pre-structured before you've even met the, 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 the students you're going to be working with you know you build that together and you use them they should be giving 90 percent of that back to you as a faculty member and you're the facilitator to really guide that process so that's what makes open edu ed education so um you know so thriving and, and, and invigorating for me is that you really never know what, where the process would take you it's like it's a real journey and um, the second big thing, and it's more of a, you know, a consideration is that access piece, especially in Canada, because we um, we can design and, uh, you know, some of the, you know, um, we can design some amazing platforms and frameworks for students. And even if uh, the, the education is open and available for everybody, the, the access point and how they are able to to meet and and, and um 
and connect with that information? Do they even know it's there? And if they do, how do they do that? Especially in rural communities or, or indigenous communities where they may just have internet, like in you know in in their their main you know indigenous uh, center within within uh, their community, and how they how they're supposed to access it. So some of the things we've been looking at are like the Raspberry Pis and. Um, and, uh, you know, different hubs in which students can do that. But don't build a mega framework if you don't if you don't have the, the capacity yet to share it out to everybody, because it's all about inclusion. Um, and lastly, you know, don't be afraid to share the knowledge. And again, like Sally and, Sally and Chad had men mentioned that too. Like, you know, before it was like, well, I just spent like all oh, year creating all these resources and they're, they're mine. I own these. And I think being an educator, we all know it's about sharing everything we do with our students, you know, with, you know, with our department, with the vision that we're going forward. And if you're going to be all in with open pedagogy, you have to be, you have to share a piece of the pie and you have to know that we're going to be creating things that other institutions, that other countries um, are going to be able to look at build upon and utilize and so you know so don't be afraid to kind of share the knowledge that's me awesome thanks lucy and i'm just of course I'll, I'll piggyback on on what you were saying i'm just going to speak from my own experience but having gone through some sessions where i, I openly used open pedagogy within my class in my own experience i i had been a knowledge disseminator i would take my knowledge i'd speak to the class and i did my best to make it as entertaining and as engaging as possible for my students but no matter what, I would, there's some that just it wouldn't connect with. And no matter how I taught certain things, it just wouldn't connect with them. So I really started trying to think of ways that I could connect with my students. And then I started, as I started learning more and more about open educational resources and open pedagogy, I started realizing that now more than ever, our students, they are content creators. They are the ones that are out there. They are making videos. They are blogging. They are chatting through Discord. Like there's, they're creating these resources that are unbelievable. So instead, I started thinking, well, instead of me creating videos and creating like taping my lectures and creating quizlets and all this fun stuff, which I, I do love, why not kind of push it back on them and have them create these resources and push back on me? And when I started doing that, it was, to me, it was unbelievable. And just to see the engagement, my engagement went up, the, the students sleeping on the desk went away for a while. Um, and I just found it extremely exciting. Now, it, do I, did I lose a lot of control at that point? Yes. And that's where I think it gets tricky. And maybe that's where some of our discussion is going to go because I was extremely organized in how I had my class. I had my lesson plans figured out almost right to the minute to throw that away and just say, here, here's what we're, I'm hoping we're going to accomplish this week. Let's go for it. It's, it's scary. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. It, it can be a little bit scary on that side. So when we talk about open pedagogy, is it all rainbows and unicorns? Absolutely not. So that's something that we will see. Anybody who's used these models knows, but it is, is it something that is invigorating, exciting, and sometimes spicy? 100% yes. So as we, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I thought you were. No, I was just, I was just going to say like, next up, I was, I was going to kind of pass the questions off to, to Lucy, because what we've done is we've structured some questions just to keep ourselves on track. And Lucy's going to kind of facilitate the questions. But Sally, if you have something you want to add to that. Gonna, before, we, before we do hand over, I just want to add in there that um, they might get missed here, but um, anybody that wants to search um, If It Ain't Broke, uh, Break It is an article that Chad wrote, I think, about four years ago now. It's just a short article, blog article and um, blog post. And it's really good because it talks about um, that shift that I was on about earlier, uh, about how we have to shift as educators their mindsets about what it means to be a great teacher and what it means to learn. And I think, Chad, you did a great job of capturing that. You were so well organized. You had all your PowerPoints, all your lesson plans done. Chad did everything everything that most of us were trained to understand is what makes a great teacher. And then when you watch this, um, you know, the journey that he went on, I think that article captures it really well. So maybe we can get that link out to folks uh, at some point. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks there, Sally. Uh, Lucy, we'll let you take All the right. reins here. 
Yeah, so let's let's jump into some um, you know directed questions and um, and really find out and 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 from the perspective of our roles now that we're in um, because we were all faculty we have moved into you know more of an administrative position now where we do lead departments we lead faculty so from the perspective of our experience and our role so let's jump into talking about student agency. Um, and the first question that, that we have is, what shifts have you experienced in students' lives using open pedagogy? What shifts? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, um, Lucy. And I think the big one for me is really when we come back to designing learning outcomes. And when we design our learn learning outcomes from the mindset of by the end of this program, what is that learning leaving with? Not what they do in your program. And we're all educators here, so we don't need to get into the nuts and bolts of, uh, of that kind of thing. But what um, the open pedagogical approach is that what I found is by in, you know, enacting this approach within my teaching practice is that learners leave with conceptual understandings. They don't leave with deconstructed competencies and a skill set that enables them to do very well in multiple choice questions or very well in, you know, papers or whatever. They actually have applied their knowledge to, uh, you know, situational circumstances that with so many variables. The, and I think when we design our learning activities from that problem-based um, approach, um, especially if we're doing, you know, team-based learning as well, and obviously we can't just you can't just take pieces of this pie and embed it. I mean, if you haven't designed your learning outcomes with a conceptual understanding in, you know, framing those, just to add on team-based learning is not going to work. But if we've got all these pieces of the puzzle, what I see is learners leaving um, prepared for, um, you know, the dynamic world that they're entering into now that they are more prepared for rapid pace changes. You know, they're more, their digital um, fluency is, um, is, is ready for the world that they're entering into. And I think that this is preparing learners to be adaptable because they're taking ownership. We're providing them with this opportunity to take ownership of their learning, to know that when their problem solves something that they didn't just regurgitate the response that was required or do something that somebody had out done before. They are actually, you know, tapping into that innovative side as well. So I would say the big, the big change that I see is in our graduates and how prepared they are for the world that they're going into. So that gap between, you know, uh, post-secondary education and the workplace, I think, has lessened. What I 100% agree. And what, what there's so much to unpack when we start talking about student agency. Um, one thing that I would, I would say is when, for my, oh, my own students, when they were going through all this and, and having taken them through these student-based projects and team-based projects, it, it becomes more about metacognition than about subject matter. Our students, like the subject matter is out there. In fact, if I'm going to lecture on something, if I, say I'm going to lecture on Ohm's Law, somebody else has done it better than me on YouTube. So instead of me sitting in front of a class doing that, why not provide them that to watch later and provide a situation where I can facilitate? What I have found in some of the comments I've heard from my students, so how is it affecting their lives, is when they're in these projects, instead of learning how Chad thinks and how Chad works out these problems, they're learning about how their entire class thinks. And so they're learning that there's not always one right way to do it, that there's other ways to think about things. There's, they're seeing other avenues and other pathways into ideas. And so what I love about that is the idea that it's, it's, um, it just allows them to have a voice that they didn't have before. And so often our voice as an instructor is so loud that it drowns out the student's voice, mm -hmm. right? And so it opens that up. And it allows them to have their voices. It allows them to explain things in their ways. Anybody who's taught knows that the best way to learn something is to teach it. Well, why don't we give this, these little micro lessons to our students? And then we start seeing their lives be enriched from that. And like, like Sally was mm -hmm. saying here, 
it's exactly about preparing them for what's happening out in the, in the real world. With I mean, we've seen it with the with education and and the great pivot of of um, COVID. Like we we all had to pivot and get sorted out and all that, and we fell down a lot. But we need to teach our students that that's going to happen, and no matter what, whether it's a pandemic or not, in real life. So that's that's kind of I'm going to get off my soapbox and stop my rant now and let uh, Lucy take over. No, I mean, it, that that leads into like our um, our second question. Um, you know, what does student HD look like in the use of, of OP in education? And, you know, one of the things that I think it also does is it prepares students to walk into a classroom. I mean, there's also, you know, we can have um there, there are different resources that students can pick up before they go back into education or before they enter the program so that they do feel like they have some of the tools before they sit in a room and have this um, this fear like, you know, do I belong here? Am I in the right place? If they can access some of this knowledge before stepping into the realm. But but yeah, so what does what does student agency look like um, in the use of OP in education? So- and, and, and also what are the risks? It, you know, what the risk to education if agency is open to those, um, you know, who that it, to agency is open to those who who have um, you know, education is being delivered. You know, what are the risks involved there? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I um, just t- going back to what Chad was saying about that dialogue in the classroom. And I think for what I take from that is that we're making learning visible when we talk about these metacognitive practices that, but we're, we're creating environments where this dialogue takes place. It makes learning visible. We're providing these opportunities for that to be shared. And so students are actually learning how to learn. And I think that's the big difference. We've all sat in classes and we can, you know, the smart students are there and we know they know how to learn. We know that they do. But that gap, that gap between um, knowing, how how do we get there? If we're just depending on our own um, life experience and this gets into, and I knew this was going to come up at some point, but like the Vygotsky and social constructivist (laughs) theory is that we are shaped. We are shaped by our um, social, cultural history. And so that we know that the, when we talk about access, we know that the starting line is not the same for all of our students. But also, we, I think that by enacting these open uh, pedagogical approaches within our classroom, when we do make learning visible and we're actually supporting in uh, learners in how to learn, this is something that they need to continue, will need to continue all of their lives. And so I think that when we first started adding on lifelong learning into, you'd see that at university uh, visions and program outlines and things like that. But it is actually preparing learners for lifelong learning. So, um, Lucy, sorry, I've forgotten actually what your question was. Oh, I know what is the risk. And and I'm just going to shape, I'm just going to shape this conversation up so Chad can pick it up. I think I'm going to take this from the angle that when you first, um, you know, take on these shifting your your pedagogy in your in your teaching, there is a there is a risk. Chad mentioned it earlier. Like you feel like okay, this control here. There is this moment where you create these these uh, participatory learning, you put the problems out there and you let the students tangle with this. Now, obviously, there needs to be dialogue, but the dialogue comes in more questions, not in answers, guiding the questions through that. And then you have this moment of waiting to see what is going to come back to you. There's that little bit of risk. But I think there also is the risk that really happens is how open do we go? And, and I was fortunate to have those of you that, that anybody with any time and energy that they've put into OER and OEP will be familiar with Dave Cormier's name. And so I, I was fortunate to spend three days with Dave at Digital Pedagogies Lab. And one of the things that we came away with is how open 
should our classrooms be? How open should our pedagogy be? And this is where I'm just going to leave it with Chad really around the risk here. Dave's word were it should never be fully open. Now, and this comes back to our outcomes. Like we want our clearly defined outcomes. We cannot go into that whole discovery learning where we haven't clearly articulated the outcomes and people just go off in diverse directions. And really, they're not, they're not getting the learning that they hope to get. And they're also not getting the conceptual understandings or the practice. So I think there is, I think it's, I think it is risky. And I think we nearly really need to be very clear on our course design. And we also need to be very clear on what are those big concepts that are right there that we're aiming towards. Chad, it's yours. Take that mic. <laughs> so, yeah. so talking about risk, so we always have a joke with Sally that every time she says Vygotsky, we got to take a shot. And um, <laughs> yeah. so here we go. So I'm like, I, I don't know where we are right now. I'm <laughs> so when we talk about risks and, and all of this, there's, there's a few things that come to my mind. And then I want to say something about uh, student agency before I wrap up too. There's some tension there. And so, so I think Trisha asked in the question, like what, how do students take this? Like some students come along and they want the teacher to talk at them. They want to have their assignments. They want to write their tests and they just want a regular quote unquote, back to the way it used to be um, educational experience. It, the risk is that yeah, you're going to have students be not on board with this. I have experienced that, definitely. How, did, how do I mitigate that? A lot of conversation and explaining what, that there is a pathway to this. And then this, this builds upon exactly what Sally was saying is we do have outcomes. It is not a free for all. It's not just, okay, you know, here, that's just what, what do you guys want to make today type of thing? We have these outcomes that we need to get to. Uh, unfortunately, Nikki Wren's not here, but she uses this analogy of a bus and how as an instructor, we, we get on this bus with our, with our students and we're, we're driving them to the destination. We still need to get them there. We might, we might be able to pull off if a student says, hey, can we investigate this? Yes, we can pull it off there a little bit, but we're still facilitating. So we still need to say, okay, time's up, guys. We got to get back on the bus because we're heading that direction. So when I, whenever I talk about these team-based projects and, and like not lecturing, I've had pushback from other instructors, faculty administration. Well, what's your job then? Like, what, is, what are you doing? And your job is actually more than just lecturing at that point. It's you're keeping everybody on track. And so when you've got them working in groups, say you've got four groups or five groups, you've got five mini classes that you're trying to keep on track to make sure that they're getting to that final destination. So those are a couple of the risks that I see. I mean, there's probably many more. Um, when we mentioned like, what is student agency? There's something that really hit me today. Um, I was thinking about how, how we consume things now. Back when I grew up, not to date myself, but when I wanted to watch TV, if Family Ties was on, it was on Tuesday nights. And if I missed that Tuesday night, I couldn't watch Family Ties that week. And I'd be lucky if I get a rerun. If a movie came to the theater, Indiana Jones comes in the theater, it's there for a certain amount of time and then it's out. And then I had to wait and then I would go rent it if I could. Uh, music, I would go buy an entire album. And sometimes I'd buy an entire album for one song. And sometimes the entire album, like the Joshua Tree, which is a whole other discussion, it would be an absolute masterpiece and a, a journey throughout the whole way. Nowadays, our students have agency in the way that they consume absolutely everything. So their music, they're creating playlists. They're not listening to albums anymore. Uh, our TV shows, we're watching, we're picking and choosing. I'm watching like four different TV shows, binge watching at the time, right? Movies, we just, we watch and we consume. We don't have to go to the movie theater anymore. How does that play out with education? I'm just throwing it out there as I don't know yet, but I do know that it's something that we need to consider and it's something that we need to converse about and talk around. And that's, I know it feels like this should be a session where we have answers on this stuff, but I always joke about how we, that we need to figure out what is the next education needs to be the next Netflix. It doesn't need to be the next blockbuster. How do we, how do we do that? So that's just, when it comes to student agency, our students are very used to being able to access whatever they want, whenever they want and how they get it after that. What are we going to do with that with education? It's a challenge and we do need to address it because somebody's going to. Yeah, Chad, and if I can just, you know, say while we're on the topic of risk, with this choice and openness and, and, and 
We also need to be mindful that we don't end up depriving students of education. Mm -hmm. So, for example, one of the topics that was brought up at Digital Pedagogies Lab was how open uh, somebody was proposing first year English. And they were saying, why are we requiring these students to write in APA or MLA? Why are we requiring this? Why are we doing that? You know, does it matter if you have spelling mistakes as long as you've got the ideas out there? And so for myself, transition from, um, you know, a trades background into a university, I found myself in a first year English program that I was taking as a bridge. And this person did have the idea that they were going to throw away all these rules. You didn't need to say it didn't need to be digital. You could do actually one student had made their own paper and handwritten this uh, what was supposed to be an academic paper. But they the, the prof had removed those those parameters around this. So the academic English class ceased to be that. And in essence, it deprived me of the learning that I'd gone there for. So I think when we come back to that risk, we do need to be mindful of what does this open, what does open mean? And it doesn't mean that we throw everything away. Mm -hmm. And, And so, yeah, more questions than answers there. I, I also, yeah, and no, I also wanted to note too that you know the type of students that we're seeing now in BC. I'm not quite sure about um, Alberta, so this is probably going to be relevant, but we completely revolutionised our K to twelve system recently in BC, and we made it so that there is going to be more um, we are there's going to be more experiential learning. Students would not know how to write a multiple choice exam. They would not know how to do structured lectures or sit in a structured lectures. So over the next few years, we're going to have students coming into our colleges and universities who have never sat in a lecture lab, n- never sat in a, you know, in an examination room, never, never sat in a lecture hall. Um, they've, um, they've experienced education very differently. So there also is a gap between that. There was a lot of funding that went into the K-12 system to flip this style of learning. Uh, you know, the, the, the high school that my son will go to is fully built to deliver programs in this way. So we're going to have students coming into our post-secondary institutions that will expect that. And then we're also going to have traditional learners that are going to come in. And so, so it's also about balancing, you know, balancing that, that piece. But going through what we've been through too in the past couple of years, students have now had so many different ways in which they can um, access learning through the ag- through agency, through that, that need of, of uh, continuing their education. Um, so the lines are getting a bit blurred on, on you know, how do we move forward? And there, is, there really hasn't been any direction fully. So it's quite grey. So, um, so anyway, I just wanted to throw that in because that's something that we're struggling with here in BC. But I'm going I'm, I'm to move into the discussion of that. Sorry. Before you move on, can I just pick mm-hmm. up on one point there that you mentioned these new schools are being constructed to meet the needs of the new K-12 curriculum. And the K-12 curriculum has shifted from competency-based to conceptual, a conceptual-based curriculum. But one thing is with all this money and resources that have gone into these physical structure, the change in the curriculum, is that they have the same instructors. And the reason why I am putting this in here. So they flipped the curriculum, but if you talk to the teachers, they will say they had six PD days. Now we're talking about complete shifts in educational theory. So um, we've got all these educators, they're going into difficult, different physical spaces with different requirements. So the reason I'm putting this in here is us collectively as this group now, what does this say for us? What do our educators, what do our teams need? How do we support them? Mm -hmm. So that's coming from that teaching and learning center. And I'm fortunate to know some folks from your teaching and learning center. Um, But I, you know, that's the big question. How do a team of six people or maybe 10 people support so many faculty in what we're really asking them to shift their complete mindsets on what it means to teach and learn. Okay. 
Lucy, <laughs> hop in there. Yeah, no worries. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can drop in the, uh, the link to the, uh, the concept of that K to 12 system. So I'll do that shortly. Um, okay. So access. So is OP the golden key for innovative trends within education, or is it simply just another framework? Yeah. If everybody um, is open pedagogy, yeah. I think it's going to be fine. Just kidding. I, <laughs> no, definitely not. And I, I get scared to death when anybody says it's a panacea for everything. Like there's, it's, I think it's a great framework. I think OP is a great conversation. I don't think it's the golden, it's going to be solve absolutely everything. Um, it gets people thinking about things. And maybe our next question, well, because we're running out of time, we should talk about now what. But um, I think it's important that OP is a, is a framework and a, a conversation that needs to be had. It's not, it's not a solution. It's not the, the pill, the red pill or the red blue pill, whichever pill you're taking to go down, get out of the matrix. Um, and also we need to take time to stand back and, and um, you know, reflect on our own beliefs. So I think this is when we see those tensions in our own, um, you know, how do we ground our pedagogy? Which, which educational theorist are we grounding mm-hmm. our pedagogy in? And notice where we have those um, conflicts between our practices. So, for example, if you teach where you have an external governing board, for example, and so we also need to be mindful that we can enact open pedagogy, but then we're preparing these learners that are going to be successful out there in the workforce, and yet they've still got to get through. They're going to be assessed in ways of multiple mm-hmm. choice. And so I think then we've got these tensions between the educational theories that we're using. And so, you know, as educators, we need to stand back and notice what belief structures we're grounding our practices in and what does align align with open, um, you know, open pedagogy, which, of course, we couldn't say that without mentioning the lev. lev <laughs> Um, yeah anyway i think lucy's got another question or maybe we're yeah. to the q and a well i'm gonna yeah because i am i mean like we talk about spicy like i'm reading the chat and i was like yeah this is great um but i just want to kind of um for just for access just before we move into our you know to roles um you know how might we make op accessible as possible and um and what do we do with students in rural areas how how do we how do we support these types of students I think when we start thinking about open pedagogy and I w- something I'm trying to really kind of get built into my own practice here with my own faculty is we need to embrace those UDL principles and we need to teach our students about those principles as well. So it's inviting them into creating videos and making sure their videos are captioned, inviting them into creating audio and making sure that that's accessible. So I think when we discuss these things, Again, we need to step out of the fact that we're just there to teach subject matter. We're there to teach our students how to learn. So why not invite them into the educational design process as well? Mm-hmm. As far as rural is concerned, that is a huge, I, I, I wish I had an answer for that. Projects like the Raspberry Pi's Moodle in a Box are going a long ways towards that. I know here in Alberta, we're looking at getting, we're, they're saying they're trying to provide high-speed internet, 50 download, 10 upload to all communities. Whether that happens or not, I'm not sure, but we need to we need to address it, and I don't know if we're going to be able to figure that out. Maybe when the three of us get together, well, obviously we'll solve it. But uh... <laughs> once we open up for questions, then I think we're going to solve it. When totally, all of us here. yeah. <laughs> well, I think I, that we, you know, this provides us a nice opportunity to say: Is open pedagogy dependent on digital? And no, it's right. not. Exactly. You can enact open pedagogy in any shape or form, but what? the access to um, technology does for us is just enhances. I mean, and when then we we have this opportunity to, to design from a UDL, we, we can embed exactly, yeah. UDL yeah. from mm-hmm. the beginning. And so it just it just allows us to build on those belief structures. And students are building UDL into their TikToks and their uh, <laughs> and their Instagram yeah. posts anyway. They're doing it automatically, intuitively, without even knowing it. So, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna get to the tough question before we move into questions. 
And, um, you know, we know that open pedagogy is happening all around. It's happening all around the world. It's been happening for many, many years. Um, and, you know, now more than ever, we need to make sure that this is happening where we live. It's happening here. So now I have the, you know, associate deans. I have deans in the room, um, you know, experiencing the learning and teaching centers. We have in the room as well that, you know, that are joining us today. Um, what are you going to do about it? How, <laughs> how are you going to use your roles to, you know, to push the idea forward that this is something that should be um, a key to, um, to the, the institution's success? Mm-hmm. Great question, Lucy. I'm going to start by saying celebrate the successes. Like, let's get those successes out there. Um, uh, you know, during COVID, we were very fortunate. We pulled together a weekly virtual um, community of practice with their instructors, the digital tool shed every week was around sharing, so, you know, sharing what we were doing in the classrooms. And then that just grew and has become that community of practice. We're also sharing those successes out on the blog that's run by this community of practice. But that's only one element. We need to recognize those, but we also need to find time we, you know, faculty will always say, yeah, this looks like a great idea. How am I going to go from teaching directly marking and all of this kind of stuff and then take all this time to redesign my courses, like redesign those outcomes, look at, you know, building my own open educational resources to support or even accessing others that are available and redesigning those activities and assessment. And I think this is where, as administrators, we have to say, faculty need time to do this. Time alone is not enough. They need the teaching and learning centers. We need this, these, um, yeah, we need that guidance there for our faculty. We can't just expect, as the K-12 system did, expect our educators to flip and enact a whole new uh, pedagogical approach, you know, within, after a workshop. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I would a, a really great concept, and I'm going to jump in here because I know that you three can go on for hours. I just sense <laughs> it. I just sense it. Um, so I do want to get uh, switched over to the Q and A. Thank you so very much for just getting the ball rolling. I'm going to be really cheeky and lead off the Q and A with a question that I have that goes right back to the beginning of your uh, of your presentation, and I'm hoping that you can three give us examples. This has been primarily about process. This, this discussion up to this point has been a very extremely valuable, and uh, I recognize it in presentations throughout the week. Uh, examples such as not, you know, no more disposable assignments and so forth. What I would love is if each of you could give us very briefly a quick sense of an outcome, something that people can latch on to. I know, Chad, you have it in your blog, but if you could just, just put a breadcrumb on the trail for people, uh, we're all here, as you say, because we're part of the choir and as the fifth alto in the back, I would just love uh, a little sense of what's, what's a recognizable process that indicates the quality and potential success of, uh, of, of where you're going with an outcome. And now a little breadcrumb that I could leave is I, I, what I, one of the things I did was self and, and peer evaluation. And so having my students actually sitting down, having conversations with them about their experiences and then having them share about their experiences and working within their groups. So I could talk a long time about that, but I'll leave that as my breadcrumb, just peer and self-evaluation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think within, um, I'm, I'm actually thinking about um, educational, I'm just trying to think where to go with this, but having those with a, an outcome to have your learners apply a framework to a situation. So we know that that has been done before, but also to have them to apply, um, let's take for example, what Lucy mentioned about the K to 12 system in, um, in BC. So to, to look at the, the application of a concept-based um, approach to K to 12, to have them critically analyze that and draw conclusions 
on the, you know, the advantages of this system, but to and ask the question, what are the risks there? So somebody is performing that very high level analysis of a system that they're going to be joining, for example. So I think this is one of the key pieces that your assessments need to be authentic. So we need that. Um, they also need to be um, they need to be authentic, but they uh, they need to be accessible in in so we've got this this range of flexibility out there. I wish I'd known about this question before, Larry, because I have some <laughs> great learning outcomes that I've worked on. But all I can think right now, we really want that authenticity mm -hmm. there in the yep. alignment between our outcome and our yeah. assessment. And, and I think that's the piece where that does give that um, the learner the agency to apply it to their situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd agree too. It's um, you kind of want to, you kind of want to crack everything open like the um you know previously before in, in some of the um i'll go back to some of the trades areas that that um that we look at and that we teach we used to go in there with a mindset like this this is the um this is the history or this is where we got to where we are today and i'm going to sit and i'm going to talk to you about you know that history and then at the end you're going to you know write a paper on what i have just told you um rather than turning it around and just saying like i want you to look at you know, the lens in which you're going to be focusing this outcome in. So let's say you're going to go back and you're going to, you know, work in this environment and you're going to study in this environment and you're going to, you're going to um, take the reason that what you've learned into your context. But I want you to go away and research your culture. I want you to go away and research your, the journey um, of, of, of maybe your, you know, your culture or the where you live in the world or where you intend to work in the world and bring that back to the class. So then we have 20 students each then um, explaining in their own way, you know, how um, the, the history and the culture around, you know, what they are studying rather than you dictating that to them. So that way, then everyone's, you know, the outcome is cracked open because rather than learning a single vision, they're now able to learn to be introduced to multiple as aspects and multiple cultures, you know, all under that one umbrella. And then their mind shift will, will then change. So as they move through their program, you know, they might want to latch on to somebody else's ideas and build upon that rather than just what that one uh, professor or faculty member has has given them. So crack it open. Yeah. I was, uh, I think I was really fortunate to, to meet somebody along the way of my own educational journey that spoke about uh, Wiggins and McTie mm -hmm. backward design. Yeah. And I, and, you know, prior to that, I'd been introduced to the Dacon model. And so, you know, when we look at deconstructing concepts, I think we're in trouble. I think we're in big trouble. And when we um, assume that people learn by building blocks of piecing together these deconstructed concepts and then say, look, there you go. Now you've done it. So for me, Wiggins... Um, and Mertai backward design was really, um, we started this conversation with Michael's um, overview of what open pedagogy is. And, and even though that is just a, a paragraph, I really encourage everybody to go back, look at those areas that Chad had highlighted, because the design of your outcomes the resources that you're going to get in use, which we didn't even get into really OER here, but and your activities and your assessments, their alignment between those three is essential. And so we can love open pedagogy and see that, that it has all of this. Um, how it can increase access for learners and, and especially for the 21st century around those outcomes. But we've got to go back to a framework that, uh, that starts with those design of uh, learning outcomes. And backward design is, I think, for me, I'd love to hear from somebody else in the room if they've found another model that works for them or maybe it builds on... Um, builds on the ideas of Wiggins and McTie. I threw in a link from what their book and for chapter one, like what is backwards design. So I threw that into the chat there. 
Yeah. And I'm and, seeing- and Trish, Trisha wants to, uh, yeah, there's <laughs> Vygotsky. It's, uh, yeah. it's uh, that's her background too. So, yeah. Yeah, so I just in that Vygotsky, and the, we can't we can't end without this whole you know, <laughs> between spontaneous <laughs> concepts and scientific principles. And when we consider spontaneous concepts, what we think we know, what we think we believe, to our role as educators is to create those opportunities where we create that tension between what the learner already knows and the scientific principles. And if we can do that, we've got it. <laughs> That's brilliant. And uh, I, would, I would appreciate if as many people who are comfortable as possible would uh, open their cameras and join me miming a shot since we managed to get that into the conversation. <laughs> uh, so again, thank you very much, uh, Chad, Lucy, Sally. Thank you so much for leading us on this journey. And uh, I encourage everyone to take advantage of the rest of the day as best you can. Uh, we, we have uh, another lightning round coming up at noon mountain time. And uh, we're closing out with a network uh, bit of business this afternoon. I think, uh, I think Sarah's going to host that but we'll be we'll be doing breakout rooms and this might be another opportunity to continue the chat thank you so much for uh, for the the feedback the information uh, the blogs and uh, i believe somebody actually mentioned podcasts can we shed a light on that before we sign off yeah yeah so um tim carson who uh, and chad i think i think you both you were both the 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 parents of this podcast and um, that this was started and uh, you know there's a pipes and pedagogy and um, that praxis praxis pedagogy is um is you know you can, get, you can access it wherever you get your podcast and this is where we uh, we have some really fantastic spicy discussions mm -hmm. Sometimes Chad joins us not as himself, but as an, <laughs> as a, <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you're talking um, about. <laughs> um, but it's a really good way we talk about things that, like trends, things that pop up that have stumped us or that have you know got us thinking. Um, articles we've read, new books that have come out, um, and um, and we have guests on all the time as well. So if anyone you know starts to listen and is interested and you know wants to come on as a guest and. And, you know, and talk about pedagogy and the direction of it and, you know, um, and yeah, just crack it open, then uh, we, we'd happy, we're happy to do that. So we want to stay connected. Fantastic. Yep. Thank you all again. Thank you to everyone for coming out to play. Uh, take care. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank Have you, everyone. Day, everyone.